my outfielder had a first name, O-S-C-A-R. And my outfielder, well, it doesn't matter about his last name because he's not playing here anymore. He's playing for the New York Yankees. We got Oscar. We got Classe. We got meetings all on today's episode of Locked on Guardians. Oh. You are Locked on Guardians. Your daily podcast on the Cleveland Guardians. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's show. I'm going to adjust my camera here a little. Uh, over there is Justin. I am Jeff, and I realized we forgot to flip our screen, so I'm just going to do that now so we actually have the correct lineup. Uh, we are busy discussing all the hot news of the day, and we forgot to move our cameras around. Uh, we want to thank you for joining us on today's episode of Locked On Guardians, and to take a moment and say that today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. It's 150 bonus bucks if your team wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. Uh, so we had kind of a busy Friday. We had rumors. We had players being lost. Uh, we secret had waiver. Secret waiver. Secret waivers. Yeah, it was it was interesting. But uh, let's start with the well, the the player that actually was likely is likely and was likely to have any impact on the Guardians this year. And that would be Emmanuel Classe. Sure. Yeah. Uh, 55 subscribers away from 2000 on YouTube, by the way. So we're getting so close to you hearing us stop talking about that. So very close. Closer every day. Yeah. So obviously Jeff Passon's report on Friday is was in his uh, winter meetings preview over on ESPN. And, and look, Jeff Passon is one of the guys we would tell you to pay attention to and doesn't just put stuff out there because he, you know, like other reporters, if Jeff Passon puts it out there, then he's heard something legitimate. Now, the other thing to consider here, too, is one, I think the, the rumor, the, the lesson you always want to go back to with these rumors this time of year is who does this rumor benefit, right? Who does yes. who does this benefit from being out here? Um, and, and the wording, too. I mean, the wording, too, in in his his uh, story was Guardians are open to dealing class A. It doesn't mean they're shopping him. It doesn't mean they're going to trade him. It means they are open to listening to offers. And as I think we said last week, and as everyone else is going to tell you, um, that, that know more than us, the Guardians are going to listen on every player on the roster not named Jose Ramirez. That is too much to uh, John Morosi's dismay. That is not going to happen. But they're going to listen to trade offers and everybody else. That includes Emmanuel Classe. And I saw a lot of people lamenting this and acting like it was a foregone conclusion and complaining about money, first of all. First this of all, isn't again, about we'll, money. <laughs> not about money. We'll, we'll touch on on who does this rumor benefit, and it's obviously Cleveland, right? But yes. let's let's first get it out of the way. This is not about money, and I know people are going to say it's always about money with the Guardians. But Manuel Class A is going to make two and a half million as a base salary in twenty twenty four. Now there are obviously, I think he has a four hundred thousand dollars signing bonus, so it's technically like two point nine million. Okay, so let's 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 just you know call it three million at the end of the day. He's going to make three million dollars this year for a guy who was a essentially one of the best closers in baseball, even though he struggled last year. We'll talk about that. He is still a top five closer in baseball, despite his struggles last year for $3 million. If, if he the wasn't Guardians can't good, afford, this rumor wouldn't pop up. Right. Right. If he, right. If he wasn't in demand, then, then this rumor wouldn't pop up. And I think part of this pops up because of the Josh Hader thing too. Like a lot of places think that Josh Hader is going to get a hundred million dollars as a reliever. So, Anybody who is interested in Josh Hader would be like, wow, this manual class A option would be great because he's cheaper, he's younger, um, all that stuff, you know, and, and we don't have to pay, you know, we can just trade for him. And he's, he's already got a contract to his name. So this isn't about money because if Cleveland can't afford to pay $3 million to their closer, then they might as well just close up shop right now. There's no reason to have a team. <laughs> Well, uh, it's, it's it's not about money at that level. If that was the case, they just traded for a six million dollars, seven million dollars setup man too. So, right, <laughs> we know it's just categorically not true that they can't afford a three million dollar closer. Exactly, and, and I know people are confused too about well, why the heck did they trade for a six million dollar mil- or setup man if uh, if they're going to trade Class A? They're, that's that's not why they got it. Now, Barlow is a nice fallback option if you to be a closer if 
you do trade Class A, and if things go south in 2024, you can bet that Barlow is probably going to have trade value. If he's having a good season, you can get something back for that too. And the other thing with Class A too, it's not just about money, because it's not about money, but it's about, like you, like Jeff said, it's about value. He would be in demand on the trade market. And you have the Josh Hader thing, where if a team misses out on Josh Hader, it might be interesting. Class A has, let's see, one, he's only guaranteed like, 20 something million the next three years. Um, he's got club options in 27 and 28. So he's under contract for the next three years at a ridiculously cheap rate. That's going to be popular in a trade market. So the value you would get back in return would have to be immense. This is Cleveland just looking to see if they get bowled over. And look, if, if Jeff Passon's saying it, they probably are listening, but we know they're going to listen to anybody, not in Jose Ramirez. So, yeah. Um, like- to compare it to like the original Edwin Diaz deal, uh, Jared Kelnick at the time was a top 20 prospect after, you know, a phenomenal what draft season. Uh, Justin Dunn was a recent first round pick, but even more importantly, losing uh, the contract of Cano. And that's the thing. Yeah. Like we've seen some absolutely huge values in similar deals. I, I don't think it happens. I think they're willing to, like you said, listen, listen to talk and I wouldn't be surprised. If it's like, Oh, listen, we're not getting anywhere with this. Can we interest you in a slightly used 99? The old bait and switch. Yeah. I mean, maybe I don't, I don't see anybody really being interested in him at this point. Like, yeah, he's going to be cheap and you're obviously not going to get the same thing. Like the deals for class A and Karen check are going to be oh, immensely yeah. different. Obviously <laughs> not even remotely close. It's like, Yes. So the difference between trading for class A and, and, and trading for like a player who was on the cusp of being let go is, is going to be significantly different. Right. And OK, so Cleveland I mean, fans might also be asking, like, OK, why is Cleveland even considering trading class A or why would they be open to offers? Relievers are, are volatile, right? Like, mm-hmm. I think if they're if they did have any concerns over what happened last year with him. And, and if you're watching on YouTube, we have the stats going across the bottom of the screen and the strikeout rate did drop. The walk rate went up a little bit. It's still in good shape. The velocity is still there. He missed less bats. Um, we did have more think... blown saves like last season, the most closers, well, like, as many as Chris Perez had like his entire time here. See, I, but I feel like that's also a product of a couple of things. It's the, the amount of one run games Cleveland put him in this year uh, had a lot to do with that as well. Just lack of offense. That's going to be an issue. Um, it is, but it's also interesting the amount. Now, this is me not saying that like they should get rid of him by any means, but you know, it, it just shows more into the general volatility. And a reliever pitches. Uh, well, there's two things here. One, the other thing is Tito overused Classe. Let's just be honest about it. He was overused. And that means there's been more wear and tear on his arm, but it also means that there are more escalators in his contract that are going to be easy to hit. He has hit several escalators already, and there's even more. So later on down the line, those original uh, option years, I think are supposed to be 10 million. They're already up to 14 million each and we'll get even higher. So those option years aren't looking as good as they once were because of the amount. And if he was overused as we saw with Miller with Allen with all the other high-end relievers when Terry Francona as a manager he was great at a lot of things but his high-end relievers were a security blanket he went to too much this might be a their concern that hey th- this could be the beginning of wheels falling off I mean Cody Allen basically was done by age 29 yeah that's the other thing too look relievers blow out very fast that's that's a fact and the way Cleveland has used relievers in the past too uh, tends to blow guys out fast. If they had any concerns over uh, what happened last year, like if they saw something going in the wrong direction, right? You had the pitch clock that we felt like maybe might have impacted his performance. And there were other things going on too, just talking about mechanics and other weird things that were affecting him. You get Cleveland. Has Cleveland ever gotten out too late from a pitcher? Like, that's the other thing, too, here, right? Like, do, um, do they have enough of benefit of the doubt in this kind of thing? Like, let's let's lay this out first, too. I don't think either of us thinks that Emmanuel Classe is actually going to get traded this winter. I don't. No. I don't think so. 
I would be surprised. But again, we'll go back to who does this rumor benefit? Like, again, Jeff Passan doesn't put this stuff out just for whatever. Like, he's not one of those guys who typically gets used like that. And he's very reliable on the information he's going to put out there. So there is some validity to this conversation. They're open to it. But I think Cleveland gives that to him because it makes them look attractive as Josh Hader fallback options. And they're looking to get a very rich deal back in return for a guy like Emmanuel Classe, who is under a long-term contract. But again, as we know, relievers blow out fast and they they've run relievers into the ground before, like you said. And if they feel like this is the time they need to get out, depends on what the offer they are. obviously not going to leave value on the table with him and trade him for anything just to get out from under him. But Cleveland's never really been too late on getting out from pitchers. They've held on to guys during their playoff runs. Like you said, Allen and Shaw and, and Miller, cause they were in the middle of playoff runs, but Kluber, Carrasco, Clevenger, all those guys, they got out of there before things fell apart uh, and got good value for all of those, including Emmanuel Classe. We'll keep talking about Emmanuel Classe, Oscar Gonzalez, and, uh, if time allows, we'll see how this goes. We'll get into whether or not the Guardians need to sign Kyle Manzara to a pre-service time contract coming up on Lockdown Guardians. And before we get into all that, let's talk about how you can score with FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Right now, new customers get a $150 in bonus bets with any winning money line bet of $5. $150 bucks for you. If your team wins, if you think about joining FanDuel, no better time to get in on the action. I think the Browns play the Bears next. Maybe maybe it's the Texans. I don't remember. They got some interesting games coming up. Jacksonville. Um, oh, is it Jacksonville? Well, that's even more interesting. Oh, they got an interesting schedule coming up. Uh, Joe Flacco looked not quite elite, but the Browns also didn't look quite that elite. So you know what? If you want to win that $150 uh, on your money line bet, maybe think about a better bet than the Browns uh, right now. So... Uh, even if you're not a money line person and the app is easy to use and there's a bunch of other options available to you for uh, fun betting spreads, player props, overs, unders, and more. I know I'll be doing it for college football bowl season, one of my favorite times of year. I'll be jumping on there making wasting a lot of money. So uh, visit Fando.com slash locked on, kick off the NFL season, kick off bowl season. Uh, Fando.com is a official partner of the NFL. And we told you all week, too, if the Guardians have any news, we'll talk to uh, our pal Sully at Lockdown MLB this week, and you can catch some of that on his channel. You can catch some of that on Lockdown Sports Today, a the first national 24-7 sports streaming channel on YouTube covering the top stories with local experts, plus our national shows covering all leagues. Go to Lockdown Sports Today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel. Be on the lookout for some MLB rumors. Uh, we didn't talk to them about the Class A rumor yet because, again, I don't think either of us thinks he's going to be traded. Like, it just seems unlikely. And again, I, I don't want to say Jeff Passons doesn't have it right. He's just they're open to dealing. They're open to dealing, and I think they are open to dealing him if they can get a great deal back. Um, they're going to see if someone gets desperate, you know, right? Like if someone yeah. misses out on Hater, and they're willing to. You know, it, I think that's what it is. I really think it's the Hater yeah. thing. Like if you look across the league, right? Uh, and if well, he wants to be the basketball. highest paid pitcher in in baseball. Yeah. And over the last two years, Class A has been better. And Diaz has been better. Mm -hmm. And yeah, Hader was probably better it's last year. But <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah. But it's like, and, and Hader was better this year. Last year is more of a struggle. But like, he's older. He's got a lot more innings count on him. Um, he has some bad tweets from his high school years. He's. Yes which will come up the minute he signs a huge contract because that's the way these things happen. But he's also just not as good as class a over the last two years as a whole. So if you, one guy is going to make what max like 40 million and the other guy is asking for like closer to 140 million. That's, yeah, that's who why you're be interested in. but you're going to have to give up a lot to get him too. And if you're watching yeah. on YouTube, we've got a bunch of comparable trades uh, scrolling across the bottom, the Craig Kimbrell trade to the Red Sox, the, uh, the Sean D little one doesn't really, fit here because let's see Oakland's not interested in good players the Andrew Miller trade the Edwin Diaz trade and then the Josh Hader trade all of which again they had Edwin Diaz a lot had a lot of control left when he was traded that's an interesting one to look at but look look across the league right so the <coughs> Orioles 
Felix Bautista is going to be out all year with Tommy John. The Red Sox have Kenley Jansen. He's, you know, he pitched great last year, but he's old. Clay Holmes, I don't know. Uh, you know, the Blue Jays could use some relief help. The White Sox stink and they're giving up, so they don't need anybody. Cleveland's not trading him to Detroit. Uh, they're not trading him to the Twins. Houston's in good shape. The Angels aren't interested in good players, so they're not going to trade for Class A. The Oakland's not interested in good players. They wouldn't trade for him. The Mariners, they don't have a whole lot to give up. Uh, the Rangers, the Rangers want Josh Hader. If they don't get Josh Hader, I think they'd be interested in, in getting Manuel Class A back. Um, they would love to reverse that trade. The the Braves love cheap, good players, right? The uh, the Mets are getting Edwin Diaz back, but, you know, it wouldn't hurt to get Class A. The Phillies would love him. The Cubs would love him. I think the Cubs are the team to watch because the Cubs yeah, the are Cubs apparently like watch. the Cubs are the desperate team right now, right? By all accounts, this is the team that you know, on top of all the money they gave Council, they are going around throwing out that you know. I've seen the word desperate attached to them in free agency. Mm-hmm. You know, look at their pitching staff. Justin Steele broke through at age twenty-seven. I, I you know, I, that's a player I swung and missed on. I didn't think he was ever going to become anything. Kyle Hendricks had a nice rebound. Marcus Stroman left. James Tyon. Their best reliever was Adbert. I always get his name wrong. Azole, Alos, yeah. Azole, uh Jeffrey Assad, and Julian Merriweather. So, yeah, maybe there's a world. We'll trade them uh, Class A for Seiya Suzuki. That would be interesting. Yeah, that, and that's the other half of this, too. If Cleveland's giving up, I, mean, I shouldn't say giving up Class A. If they are really interested in seeing what they can get back for him, you're going to be getting multiple players back. You're going to be getting mm-hmm. uh, position players back. You're going to be getting outfield help back. Like this is a deal you do. If you're trying to improve your club now, plus prospects too. Like this is like uh, uh, the Mike Clevenger trade in some ways, you know, they got some immediate mm-hmm. help and they also got future help and that, that trade's paying dividends right now. And this would have to be the same thing. And class A is more valuable than, Clevenger was. He's a better player than Clevenger was, but you're looking for the same kind of trade. And maybe I know, at maybe that point, better. though, Clevenger was a borderline ace level starter. Like, I know he's kind of fallen apart since then, but he was, you know, some people consider him one of the best 10 best pitchers in baseball then. No, it was well, only a year and a half of him, but like, I, you know, I just don't want to do too much of a, you know, and it's interesting because it's like how much of value is there with a reliever, but. And I think if you could if you can get a starting outfielder like legit like you said say a Suzuki let's just say that would be one player if you can get a player like that plus other pieces that can help you now and in the future like I, I'm trading a reliever all day for an everyday outfielder that can hit 20 home runs because how many people leave comments on our YouTube every day saying this team needs a 20 home run hitter okay you know what you, how you can do that you can trade your all star closer that's one way you can, that's what it would take but. I would do that because I would do, if it gets you multiple pieces back. If he's a, I don't know how many years of control Suzuki has left, but let's forsake. But he's through like 2026. That's, so that's part of it. Like, again, I just think this is this is a rumor for that looks good for Cleveland. And people, I know fans are going to not like it, but I think it looks good for Cleveland saying, here's your Josh Hader alternative. Let's see if we can get someone to overpay for our closer. And uh, before we burn him out and get out from under this and, um, I mean, I, they're the team, always open it's, for business. It's just so it's unlikely. Like, it's the same thing with like Bieber. Like uh, we've known he's been on the block forever, not on the block per se, but like they're open for discussion um, when it comes to Bieber. And we'll see. Yeah. I, I, part of me thinks at the end of the day, like this team, you know, if we have time, we're going to get into some of the money stuff today or tomorrow. I know we have it upcoming at some point. We'll, we'll discuss that there were multiple things that kind of indicate uh, the money situation as, not as dire as maybe we expected. Um, so, you know, we'll eventually get into that. But I think I think they're going to be a team that is very similar now to what they'll be in the fall. Maybe like like mo- or in the fall, in the spring. I, I They might add someone to free agency. They might take a few small swings because they've taken a few small swings the last few years. Uh, but we'll have to see how it plays out. I just, I don't know. I watch them go make a trade tomorrow. But I feel like the two big trade assets are still the ones that feel like likely to be here when we're talking in February. Yeah, more than likely. I mean, it, it depends on what everybody else, because look, there's other teams out there that are having 
I don't want to say money issues, because let's be honest, these are all billionaires who can afford to fly to random countries whenever they feel like it. So I'm not going to feel too bad for any of them. But there are teams out there that are tightening their belts because of the TV situation. So a trade. Hey, feel bad for John Fisher. He's had it worse than you. John Fisher's had it worse than you. That's what he's telling people. Get on that plane. Go somewhere else, John Fisher. Don't listen to Lockdown Guardians. I hope John's not listening to this. Uh, yeah, it's. I it hope he is. On, I, sure. I hope I he hope is. He you know what? Is I said 100%. Oakland. Oakland is not interested in good players, and I stand by that. They're not interested in good players. Look at the Matt Olson trade. Look at the the Sean Murphy deal. Not not a knock on any of those players anyway. Um, yeah, I think it depends on what what teams are willing to do. Are they more willing to give up prospects for major league players? Are they more willing to give up money because there's other teams that are that are tightening the belts too? Another team that's going to get cheap. Outfield, I don't want to call it help because I don't know if it's going to be help, but uh, this uh, this move was kind of a kept in secret, I guess, last week. But so Oscar Gonzalez was waived; he was not designated for assignment. Cleveland tried to uh, sneak him through waivers and try to get him off the forty man roster and go to AAA, clearing up that roster spot. Look, they had a lot of guys in this roster they could have done that with. Like, there's still Alfonso Rivas is still here. Um, James Karinchak could have been an option to do something like that. Um, I don't know if there's, there's only nobody else in the roster. So there was a, there was a couple options, but we said, I know you're going to say Jose Tana. I know you're going to say Jose yeah. Tana, but um, we said it before Oscar and Jonathan Rodriguez are kind of redundant and we'll see. I know people are gonna immediately going to say, well, look, the Yankees got Gio Urshela and, and they turned him around and things are great. Yeah. They also got Jake Bowers and he was good for like a week. And then now he's on the Brewers for like nothing. He got nothing. They got nothing in return for him. Um, it doesn't always work that way. Like just because because like, it worked one time doesn't mean it's always going to work. And Urshela again, he went Blue Jays, cut by Blue Jays, cut by the Yankees. He worked out for the Yankees. I had other people bringing up Jesus Aguilar. Jesus Aguilar had two years half where he had good, season. good halves. Half. He had a good half. Yeah, he had two years with two good halves. He wasn't good. Like, and Yu Chang was still doesn't have forty career homers. No, and and. Oscar Gonzalez and Jonathan Rodriguez are very similar players in terms of their profile. Having both of them is redundant. Oscar has amazing physical tools. He works hard. He's a great individual. I want him to be successful. I want to look wrong. But you and I spent all last offseason saying you can't count on Oscar Gonzalez to be your starting right fielder because guys with this profile don't find success. Go through Major League Baseball. Every team has about three Oscar Gonzalez's in AAA with bad chase. They don't walk enough. They strike out too much. They don't play good defense and they hit too many ground balls. And this is a common profile because you're hoping you'll fix them because yeah, then they can turn into a good player. Luis Robert is kind of similar, but he has elite, well, maybe not elite, but he's a good defender in center field and has a little less chase, a little better contact. And now he's a great player, but it's a thin line between quad a and a good major leaguer. And unfortunately, most of these guys are Oscar. And again, I want to be wrong. I say never heard a nasty thing. Uh, never heard a negative thing. Great dude. Works his tail off. I hope he's successful for the Yankees. But we, there's a reason we spent the last year being like, they need to trade or add another outfielder or Will Brennan needs to step up or something. Because anyone who follows this at the granular level like we do knew Oscar wasn't going to work out. There's a reason that he didn't. And now, and now everybody gets things wrong. Like, you know, we don't ever get to have a good, uh, we, we focus on prospects and sometimes our lists aren't always good too. We, you know, you had Bybee, uh, number one, and I, I agreed with you on that, but you no, know, there are things we obviously just spent t- talked about earlier about Justin Steele and how you got that one wrong too. We all get things wrong and, and all these outlets that, that cover prospects get things wrong. Um, but there's a reason Oscar Gonzalez was not on anybody's prospect list at the time. And they didn't even protect him from the Rule Five draft. The I know the the draft didn't happen that year, but um, they didn't know that at the time. Right at the time, they didn't know that they re-signed him to a minor league deal. He became a minor league free agent, and they didn't protect him with forty man roster. So somebody could have gotten him for free. And again, twenty other teams could have said, "Hey, we like you. We'll give you a major league deal. Forget the minor league deal. Cleveland's giving you. We'll give you a major league deal. And we'll invite you to spring training." Cleveland, no one, no one beat Cleveland on that offer. He came back on a minor league deal that year. And yeah, the rule five draft didn't happen. 
and he played well in AAA. He forced his way up, and he had some good moments in 2022. And I think it's fun to mem- remember those things. Like obviously, like those mem- memories are awesome. Like the home run off Corey Kluber in a pff, game that I thought was never going to end. I was at that game, and it was like noon to like 6 p.m. It was the longest I've ever been at a ballpark in quite some time, except for that. I think I was at that 15 or 17 inning game that year against the Twins, but. That was that was super fun. The the walk off against the Yankees that he had that was super fun too. Like the SpongeBob music, the SpongeBob music that played at it was he was the batter that came to the plate after Jose Ramirez got ejected for punching out Tim Anderson. Like how funny was that that he punched out Tim Anderson and there's this this ten minute fracas on the field and then the next batter comes to the plate and you get the SpongeBob theme song. Like that's hilarious. He's hilarious and he gets you know he gets it. The the kids love him and. He's a fan favorite. I get that. Like you said, he's a good dude. This profile, though, the baseball side of it is is hard. Like he was in the first percentile in chase rate. That is the worst place you can be. He was one of the worst players in baseball the last two years at chasing pitches out of the zone. Um, he, if he had qualified in 2022 with enough at bats, he would have led baseball in chase rate above Javi Baez. Who, if you've seen Javi Baez play, the guy has. You know, never seen a pitch. He didn't think he could hit everywhere. Um, he had a he had a forty eight percent chase rate in twenty twenty two. Okay, the average chase rate in twenty twenty two was thirty two point six across baseball. Last year, he had a fifty percent chase rate. The average chase rate in baseball last year was thirty one point nine. That does not work. He had a three forty five BABIP in twenty twenty two that held a lot of this up. And like Jeff said, the ground ball rate's incredibly high. So you're not getting, even though Gonzalez probably has a raw power guy who can hit 30 home runs. Like if he got to all of his power in game, you could easily see a 30 home run hitter. But the problem is he doesn't pick a good, good, doesn't pick good pitches to swing at. And when he does, he hits a lot of ground balls. There's too many balls. He thinks he can do, he can hit like there. We talked about the slasher. There's such a thing as too much contact, and Oscar doesn't walk to, to offset when he uh, goes through BABIP struggles or hits bad, you know, bad stuff across the, the infield. You know, when you go through slumps, if you can take a walk, you can limit how how far your offensive floor falls. And for him, he doesn't have that. So and he's not he's not giving you value in right field. He's got a great arm, but his routes, his reads are not good. Like. <laughs> The Yankees need outfield help too. I mean, this is a team that had Jake Bowers out there. This is a team that had Franchi Cordero. They said they want to add two outfielders this year. I here here's my prediction: Does Oscar Gonzalez make it to spring training with the Yankees on their 40 man roster? I'm going to say no. I'm going to say they're going to acquire another outfielder and they're going to DFA him off their roster and try to uh, pass him through waivers like Cleveland did because that's what Cleveland tried I, to do. Cleveland didn't yeah. want to lose Oscar Gonzalez. They they tried to do this in a way that he would he would clear waivers and they didn't lose him. But at the end of the day, they also weren't going to be upset if he was gone. And I wonder what this I, says about their if this is about Rule Five too. If they're going to give themselves a chance to grab somebody in the Rule Five draft. Yeah, now. you know, I said that basically it means three things. At the time, it meant that maybe a move was coming, that it was to open a Rule 5 spot, or that um, they're trying to sneak him through. Could be two and three. I think he sticks with the Yankees. The Yankees don't have a ton of depth, right? I, I think they have a better chance of stashing him on the 40-man. He doesn't have to be on the 25-man, right? He still has an option left, so I think he's going to be there. That is the interesting He has options left. That's why it was interesting that Cleveland let him go. But, you know, Cleveland... For his for the Yan- the Yankees outfield is not good either. Like they have Aaron Judge, who obviously Cleveland would be the best player on Cleveland. He'd be the best player on a lot of teams. But after that, their outfield's not good. Like they don't have good outfielders. So uh, we'll see. I mean, I, oh, they do have Jason Dominguez, who's going to be out for I don't know how long this year with TJ. Um, yeah, we'll probably see. most. I would I wouldn't be surprised. If this so they're they're forty man's at thirty seven. If they acquire somebody this off season. I would not be shocked if Oscar is a guy they try to pass off their 40 man roster to um, save room. We'll see. I don't know, but a lot of uh, the other part of this we didn't discuss either was I saw a lot of people saying like, I can't believe that um, Cleveland chose Oscar over Nolan Jones and Will Benson. And I still think it had more to do with how much they like Will Benson. We've heard people say that, there's a lot of people internally in this system that like Will Benson or not Will Benson, Will Brennan, 
Will Brennan better than other outfielders on this 40 man roster. I'm not going to name names, but there's a lot of people who think Will Brennan is the best outfielder on this 40 man roster right now in this, in this organization. Uh, I think, I think that those trades had more to do with, with believing in Will Brennan. They did Oscar Gonzalez as yeah, evidence had- by the fact that Oscar was back in triple a when his, when the, the glass slipper stopped fitting him. Yeah, I, I think it also had more to do with like really liking Juan Brito and additionally, well, that too. Uh, Benson having trade value. And I don't think Oscar did have a ton of trade value. I think if he had, then maybe um, maybe they would have saw a trade last year with him. But you and I wish him well. It just, yeah, it, sure. it's a profile that doesn't work. Like that's just bottom line. It's a profile that doesn't work. But what does work is all of you out there who work every day, subscribing, listening, reading, reviewing, doing your part as everydayers. Uh, we're going to have so much to talk about this week with the winter meetings. If nothing else. We have draft lottery. We have rule five. So you're going to want to tune in for all of that. Um, Thank you all for joining us each and every single day. Remember to subscribe, 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 as we are 55 away from 2000, I believe. We're going to get that before the end of the year. And go, go, Guardians, go.